Why are these people protesting outside in the freezing cold weather of Cambridge, Massachusetts? It's your property, so is your patent. They're protesting Novartis's abuse of the TRIPS agreement, faulty disclosure, and rampant evergreening. Confused? So was I. But with the help of my friends Simon and Maya, my two classmates from Williams College, things started to make a lot more sense. We'll talk to them and experts in the field to learn more about the relationship between developing countries and big pharmaceutical companies over drug patent protection. We'll also figure out how a country can defend itself against abuses of their rights. So let me count off the basics. One, HIV AIDS is a worldwide pandemic that afflicts over 30 million people around the globe. That's a big number, right? Two, a lot of people don't know this, but there are drugs available that can prolong a person's life for decades. Three, the problem is that poor countries can't get to these drugs because of what is known as patent protection, which keeps the drugs at a price so high that they're just too expensive for a lot of the people who need them. Oh right, I didn't explain. Patent protection is the exclusive right that large companies are granted to produce a certain kind of drug. As the only ones with that exclusive right, no one else can produce the same drug even if it means that they can produce it at a cheaper price. What are the implications of this? Listen to my friend Paul. The, the problem that is in this, the, the, for instance, the disease burden that Africa and other poor parts of the world have, have, have now has become a very huge economic stepping stone for richer countries. Wait, what, Paul? Just like Paul said, it leaves developing countries in a very vulnerable state. The disease afflicts them severely, and patent protection keeps drugs out of their reach. But what about TRIPS? TRIPS is the Agreement of Trade-Related Intellectual Property Rights. It defines how intellectual property, like the chemical makeup of medicines, can be protected. But it is also important to understand that TRIPS is very flexible. Articles 27.1 and 1.1 of the TRIPS Agreement say that patents must be granted for inventions, provided they are new and involve an inventive step. But countries are, quote, free to determine the appropriate method of implementing the provisions of this agreement, end quote. Sure, TRIPS has standards, but they are up for interpretation. Countries can interpret them according to their own needs. Article 27.2 of the TRIPS agreement goes on to say even more explicitly the rights that countries have against patent-seeking corporations. Quote, Members may exclude from patentability inventions to protect human, animal, or plant life or health. So why should countries even care? If a large pharmaceutical company requests a patent, the country is totally within their rights to deny them a patent in the interest of the people in the interest of public health. Years later, in the Doha Declaration on TRIPS and Public Health, it was said that, quote, the agreement can and should be interpreted in a manner supportive of a WTO member's right to protect public health. Hold on, hold on. What does that really mean? Well, Melinda, this basically means that the Doha Declaration of 2001, seven years after the establishment of TRIPS, improve government's ability to keep its citizens healthy. When a pharmaceutical company is successful in acquiring a patent, they are required by Article 29.1 of TRIPS to, quote, disclose the invention in a manner sufficiently clear and complete for the invention to be carried out by a person skilled in the art, end quote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how can countries use this to their advantage? If a pharmaceutical company doesn't disclose enough information about their process, a country can refuse to grant them a patent. You could say, hey, this is lousy disclosure. If you have a high standard of best method, you can say, this isn't the best method. Are you kidding? You know, I could, you know, my expert can barely figure out what this is about, let alone what's the best way to do this. 
So yeah, you can you can challenge best method as well as inventive uh, inventive step, and that's why having a best method standard is really good because you can say, hey, you just haven't given enough disclosure. Well, that's great in theory, but how about giving us some real examples? Well, let's take India, the site of the world's largest generic drug market. India is particularly important to low and middle income countries, where drugs produced by Indian generic manufacturers make up almost 70% of ARV purchases by those in need. So they've been fighting pharmaceutical companies too? How? Three, the problem is that a lot of poor countries can't get to these drugs because of what is called patent protection, which keeps the prices so high that it's just too much for a lot of people. It's what I was commenting to you before that they'll discover and use for a medicine that's already out on the market and then because they're not going to be able to get a patent on it and make a ton of money, they're going to spend another ton of money trying to change it ever so slightly so that they can get a patent. Yeah. And so medicine that's helpful isn't being put out there. India guarded against this evergreening in Section 3D of its Act, saying, quote, the mere discovery of a new form of a known substance which does not result in the enhancement of the known efficacy of that substance cannot be treated as an invention. The act told companies they couldn't get a patent on a new drug that wasn't actually new. Novartis is a large multinational pharmaceutical company that produces Glyvec, a drug for cancer patients. When it asked that its Glyvic patent application be processed, Indian cancer patient groups and several generic drug manufacturers filed a pre-grant opposition claiming that Glyvic was actually a new form of an old drug which was from 1993, prior to TRIPS being implemented. Novartis appealed the denial of its patent application, claiming that the denial of the Glyvec application was erroneous. Moreover, Novartis challenged the constitutionality of Section 3D of the India Patents Act, Novartis, in its petition, claimed that the section was not in compliance with the TRIPS agreement and hence should be declared unconstitutional. In their defense, Novartis said many false and hypocritical statements. Just look at that last one. They claim that high markup sales in India are crucial to finance future research and development. But India is only 1.3 of the global pharmaceutical market. Novartis tried defending its lawsuit, but it was completely in the wrong. Luckily, activists were able to expose the argument's weaknesses, and the Indian courts ruled against the company. It was also an eye-opener with regards to the issues on overgreening and how dangerous it could be, and how coming together, you know, to, for, a, for, for a, an excellent goal could pressurize or force the pharmaceutical companies not to do what they would have otherwise done had it been such collaborations. Although Glyvec, the drug in question in the Novartis vs. India case, was for the treatment of cancer, the ruling extends into the realm of drugs for HIV AIDS and other diseases that afflict the poor and overall public health. Studying the case should enable countries to understand the importance of using the TRIPS flexibilities to their advantage. They should create stricter standards of patentability, which opens the market to generic drug makers and allows them to sell drugs to the poor at a far lower and more reasonable price. If drugs are cheaper, non-governmental agencies, as well as actual governments, will be able to purchase and distribute more drugs with the same level of funds. Even when these two institutions fail, individuals themselves will find the drugs more economically accessible. Greater affordability, and therefore access to drugs, will significantly increase the health and general welfare of countries that are currently the site of so much suffering. We want to thank Brooke Baker for the use of his educational materials in the making of this film. We also want to thank the hundreds of activists who stood up in the face of difficulty and the all-consuming power of a large pharmaceutical company to defend what was right. Because of them, we know that countries can adopt TRIPS flexibilities and work towards making drugs affordable and accessible to all those who suffer in their country.